prazer recebê-lo aqui. Então, obrigado, Pablo. Ai, olá. Isso. Escuta? Can you hear me? Okay, great. So, I'm going to speak in English because my Portuguese is not very good. <laughs> so, um, I'd like to thank Alexander for the opportunity to speak here. I'm very happy to speak in this uh, auditorium named after such a great Uruguayan mathematician. And I'm a bit nervous that I'm on the YouTube now, but uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I hope not to disappoint. So, I'll go, go right into the, the subject. I'm going to talk about uh, some generalizations of theorems uh, from the 60s by, by Furstenberg, where you, you can calculate the rate, the Lyapunov exponent of a product of random matrices with some uh, integral involving an uh, unknown measure on a, on a boundary space of the space of matrices. So, but instead of giving some abstract uh, talk about this, I want to give you two examples. One which is kind of a toy example which one can solve with the methods from the 60s. <laughs> and another, another one where the, pro the questions uh, were open until last week, maybe. So there's a paper this year in analysis of probability with uh, some of the results, and there's a preprint uh, with some other results which are attainable. So let's jump right into it. The first example. Oh, I forgot to <laughs> be aware of the time. Okay, so let me, let me do this. Okay. So the first example, let's call it a uh, right angled uh, random walks on the hyperbolic plane. And so the idea, okay, I'm not going to use much uh, formal uh, notation like you do in dynamical systems. I'm going to give somewhat, uh, you know, suggestive, uh, okay, I'm just going to say some things which I hope will, you will be able to imagine something. So the idea is uh, starting at, the, at some point, well, let's, let's, let's put it better, standing in the hyperbolic plane. Do the following. So the first, uh, there are three steps. The first step, this is legible, okay, is you turn a random angle which is either 0, 90, minus 90, or 180 degrees. Okay, so imagine you're at a corner and you're, you're going to pick one of the four streets. And then the second one is uh, you advance a distance r, positive, which is fixed throughout, okay? It's always the same, the same r. And the third, third step is just you repeat, okay? So if you do this in the Euclidean plane, you can all imagine you're just walking on a grid, on a square grid with size r. And the behavior does not depend on r because you have a scaling which, which will send one r to another, so it's, it's, it does not depend on r. But in the hyperbolic plane, I'll just recall some basic, uh, basic facts. So, okay, I know most of you know this, but uh, I don't want to lose people in the first five minutes of the talk, so the Poincaré disk model of the hyperbolic plane is just, you know, you have this set, the unit disk in the plane uh, with the metric. I can write an explicit formula, but maybe it's not so useful. So what this means is the following. You have a disk. But inside this disk, you're going to measure things in such a way that a small set here at the origin will have the same size as something much that looks much smaller in the Euclidean distance uh, here. So the idea is that these have the same, same hyperbolic size. Uh, 
And this guy, the, that formula tells you that the Euclidean size is more or less the distance to the boundary. The Euclidean distance to the boundary, right? So when you move, in this, in this geometry, the interior of this Euclidean disk is, is an unbounded world. And when you move something without changing its size, in the Euclidean distance, it looks much smaller when you, when you approach the boundary. I'm sure much of you, most of you know about this uh, type of thing. So OK. We're doing OK. In this geometry, the geodesics, so the shortest paths between, between two points, they're unique. They exist uh, between any pair of points. And they are uh, diameters and uh, circle arcs. Arcs perpendicular to the boundary. Right? OK, so you have something like this. Yeah. And the other thing is that the angles, when you measure them uh, in the hyperbolic way or the Euclidean way, are the same. So it's conformal to the Euclidean metric. And so an important thing when you think about this walk is that in the, in the hyperbolic plane, there are no, there are no squares. Okay, it's a very easy going place. There are no squares. in hyperbolic geometry. It's impossible to construct uh, a geodesic uh, polygon with uh, interior right angles with four sides. But there is uh, a sequence. Let's call it R5, R6, R7, etc., where Rn is the side. It's unique. Of let's call it the because it's unique up to congruence. Uh, n gone. Regular n gone. With uh, interior right angles. And so, what's the point? If okay, let's, let's split this one in two. If the distance which this random walk is, is advancing is equal to one of these particular values, then the random walk stays on uh, what do we call this uh, tessellation. I'll draw some. So let's let's suppose these are R five of length, and you get something like this. Okay. These are all R five, R five, and these uh, pentagons with interior right angles they tile the hyperbolic disk with uh, four per vertex. So if you if you choose to advance. So this is a family of, of random walks, right? If, if r is equal to one of those lengths particularly, you, you stay on a, on a tiling, like in the Euclidean case. But it's a tiling by uh, n gons, where n is five or more. OK? And uh, if r is larger than, OK, th this sequence, I didn't say it, but you can calculate explicitly. I mean, it's a bounded sequence. And so there's a limit. And if r is larger than that limit, uh, the walk stays on a, on a tree. And it looks something like this. Okay. You have geodesics. Et cetera, et cetera. It goes on forever, and these these are all R uh, of length R. Every one of those is length. And otherwise, the 
will walk, can go, but doesn't, <laughs> to a dense set. For all other values of r, smaller than that uh, r infinity and different from one of these r5, so any r in between r5 and r6, the set of points which you can get to by, by uh, turning right angles and, and advancing r is dense in the, in the disk. But I don't know a short proof of this, though. OK, but it's not, it's not that important. So for small r, it's something called the Margulis lemma, which is important in hyperbolic geometry. Yes? No. And that's the question which, uh, OK, so the, the question I want to, to address is uh, the following. Let me write it somewhere. <laughs> so the main question, which I want to talk about in, in this and in more general context, is, uh, is the speed, OK. limit from distance of x0, xn. OK, xn is the position after n steps of the walk. Is this speed positive? And the answer will, in this case, the answer is yes. And this is the example I, I was telling you that follows from methods of Furstenberg from the 60s. It's, you can translate this into some product of matrices and, and obtain this. Uh, the question is about a Lyapunov exponent, and there's a criteria for, for positivity. Okay. So that's, that's the main question which I want to, to address. And so for large r, in this case, it's very easy to see that, that the speed is positive. If r is very large, you're walking on a tree, and the tree is embedded, uh, I don't know how, what to call it, uh, it's uh, quasi-isometrically into the disk. So on the graph, you're going to be at distance more or less 1 half n after n steps. It's easy to calculate. You have three possibilities which take you one step further and one which takes you closer. And if you're at distance n in the, in the graph, you're at distance at least some constant times n in the, in the hyperbolic uh, plane for r strictly larger than r infinity. So that case is easy. But for the other cases, there's no easy geometric argument which, which tells you if speed is positive or not. OK, so let me check. Right, here we're done. OK, so let's do the second example which is uh, more recent. People solved this case uh, this year. <laughs> OK, so the second example is, uh, let's call it a hyperbolic, we call it a Poisson de Launay, random walk. And, oops, sorry. OK, so essentially, this, these types of walks, uh, for the case r equal rn, you're walking on some regular uh, tessellation of the plane. And the idea, or the, the, this, this type of object, what you're doing is you're walking on some tessellation of the plane, but which is not regular. It has some statistical regularity. And you want to know if, if, if you can prove the same type of, of results in this case. So the, the construction goes like this. I, I won't be very precise. Uh, take a random discrete subset of, of, of the plane, um, and let p0 be p union 0. OK, so you have some discrete subset. You can, you can suppose it's just fixed, and the there's a parameter also in this model, which is uh, lambda points per unit volume. OK, there's a very natural way to do this, uh, which is called the Poisson point process. And okay, I can't say much about that, <laughs> given the time constraints. But OK, you can imagine just for what I'm going to say next, just a fixed discrete set in the, in the plane. And what you do is the following. Okay. The Voronoi cell of a point x in your discrete set is the set 
This is an important construction, even in the Fuchsian group case. Uh, it's the set of points which are closer to x than to other, any other point in the, in the discrete set. Okay? So the way to imagine this is that uh, the points of your discrete set are cell towers, and you're looking at the set of points which have the strongest signal from x than from any other tower. That's the, that's the idea. And it gives you a, a tessellation. A tessellation uh, by convex polygons. Okay? Because to, to construct the Voronoi cell, you look at the points which are closer to x than to some other point in the, in the discrete set. So that's a half plane. Now you intersect with. Also, I want to be closer to x than to this other point. That's another half plane. You intersect, and you get a convex polygon. These are called Dirichlet domains in the, when you do group, uh, Fuchsian groups. And the idea is that you're going to walk on this tessellation. You're going to walk from one cell to the next, to the next, to the next, choosing at random. Okay? So uh, consider a walk xn starting at Uh, x0 equals 0, where at each step you pick uh, a neighbor. Let's call it the Delaunay neighbor. The definition of Delaunay neighbor is uh, that the cells intersect at random. Okay, so let me look, tell you what this looks like, more or less. Okay, this is a tessellation by polygons, and when you look, what you're, look, you're doing is you're looking at the dual graph, which two cells uh, share some, some point. And what happens is that this is a, it's a triangulation. The Delaunay graph. is a random triangulation. So it looks like something like this. You have the, your point, and then you're, you have a certain number of triangles here, which are neighboring cells in the, in the Voronoi tessellation. And then, but each guy can have a different number of, of, uh, of neighbors. Some of them have a lot, and some of them uh, don't have very many. Okay, so it gives you a tessellation, uh, triangulation of the of the hyperbolic plane. This uh, just looking at points uh, whose Voronoi cells uh, intersect, you get a triangulation. Okay. Uh, so okay, you're looking at some walk on uh, on, a tess on some sort of tessellation of the plane, but it's not regular like this. It it looks uh, different. There are some places where it looks. Uh, Maybe it looks something like this, and then some places it looks like uh, for some other number, R6 or R7, and you're trying to walk on, on some uh, irregular structure, which is statistically regular. But the, the question still still holds, so the question is still question. Uh, is the speed, you know, limit distance from x0 to xn? over n, positive. Okay. And, okay. So how are we doing so far? We're a little bit delayed, but we're, we're okay. All right, so let me give a definition, which is sort of abstract, but I like it because there are lots of examples including these two, and including uh, classical things where you study Laplace exponents. So uh, my, my definition is the following. Definition. A random sequence of points. Let's call it xn. Is, let's call it distance stationary. If, and I'll just write it in the most efficient way, 
and then try to give some explanation. Okay, so what it says here is, uh, let's put something around this. What it says here is distribution of the distances between points on the sequence does not change if you shift the sequence one, one step. So what this means is the following. For example, if the first three points had a certain probability, let's say one half of being uh, on a equilateral triangle, then the second, third, and fourth point also have that same probability of being on an equilateral triangle the third, fourth, and fifth also. So the idea is that any pattern which you can detect with the distances between, let's see, the first n points of the sequence will have the same probability of occurring anywhere else along the sequence. And you can, you can write down something where this, with this means that a certain measure is invariant under some, some transformation. Okay? So you're doing ergodic theory uh, like dynamicists uh, do. So the... The important thing about this definition is that there are, there are lots of examples. Okay? So, okay, the, the two, two random walks discussed our examples. And let me give one more. Let me give one more example. Another is the following. You take a sequence, A1, A2, et cetera. Okay, I'll write it like this, because I, I don't know, I like probabilistic notation more, but it's an IID sequence in SL2R. So what I'm doing is I'm considering on the products uh, space of sequences of matrices, I'm looking at a, a Bernoulli measure, mu times mu times mu times mu, okay? And uh, you write a n times a one. You take the uh, what's it called? The polar decomposition, right? This is orthogonal, and this is symmetric uh, and positive. Symmetric, and the eigenvalues are positive. And so the idea is that when you take norm of this, the only thing that matters is the positive part. The, the, the orthogonal part doesn't change any norm, so you're, you can ignore it. So if you're interested in lapid of exponents, growth of, of vectors and things, all you need to look at is the positive part. And so the example is that uh, the sequence xn equals pn square is distance stationary. If you want to be more, uh, I don't know, fancy, you can say that you're looking at the projection of this product into the quotient space SL2R divided on the left by SO, SO, uh, R, SO2. So, and that sequence in this symmetric space is distance stationary. There's a unique, uh, interesting metric on the, on the space of pos symmetric positive matrices. So, and this, in this case, it's just a hyperbolic plane, but you can do it for other uh, sizes of the matrices. So this, this is the, the way in which is this, this uh, definition is related to the classical, classical case. Okay? And, uh, okay. So I want to state a theorem about the speed of distance stationary sequences and see that it, that it has interesting consequences. That's my objective for the talk. I skipped a bunch of examples because I'm a bit late. Okay. But before I can do that, I have to talk about uh, Horo functions, which I can't assume that everybody knows about. So, but it's very simple. So this is Horo functions. Okay, so the idea is we're, we're trying to understand the asymptotic behavior of a sequence of points in a nice space, like hyperbolic space or some symmetric space. Or, okay, you can do it on a complete separabolic space, but most of the interesting examples are some type of homogeneous space. And uh, you want to understand what happens when the points go far away. So there's a notion of distance uh, where, the, where the distance is measured to the, to the boundary at infinity. You measure like the distance to infinity. 
So this is what, what uh, this geometric concept, horror functions, also called sometimes Boosman functions, uh, captures. I think the abstract definition is due to Gromov, but uh, this, is, this is well studied in negative curvature case uh, by many people. So the, it's very easy. We'll, we'll, we'll just do the examples. In the real line, what you do is the following. For each x, you define a function, chi sub x, which is explicitly this thing. And I'll give you a graph. So the idea is to take the distance function to x, but you, you normalize it so that at 0, it's, uh, it's 0. So it gives you something like this. It's the identity here. You get up to absolute value of x, and then it goes down. This is chi sub x. And then all you have to do is add, add the functions which are limits of these things when x goes, goes far away. That's all. So you add, OK, chi sub plus infinity, which will be just the identity function which is what happens to this graph when x goes to infinity, is it looks like the identity. And you add uh, chi minus infinity, which is minus 1. OK? And uh, okay, that's, that's all. And these, these things are called horror functions. And the ones you added are called boundary horror functions. OK, I'm not going to write that down. And in general, so some metric space, you're going to define chi x equals to something like this, where this is some fixed base point. And you take the limits of these. And the ones, the, the limits you obtain of these functions, which are not of the form chi sub x, are the boundary horror functions. It's the horror function boundary of your space. OK, let's get back to some example. Oops. So in Rn, boundary horror functions. Uh, are linear. And they are of the form chi of x equals the inner product of x with v, where v has norm 1. And the reason for this is that the level sets of the function chi sub x are just the circles centered at, at uh, x. And when you look at the circle centered at x, which passes through 0, when x goes very far away, it starts looking like a, like a straight line in the, in the plane I'm talking about. So that level sets of the limit functions are straight lines. And then you can do some calculation, and it's just, a, it's just a linear function. And the other one I'm interested in is the hyperbolic plane. I'll tell you what it is. Boundary horror functions. are, OK, chi of z equals log of z e to the i theta for some theta. And this is the Poisson kernel. Poisson kernel. So what it looks like is the following. You pick some point on the boundary. And the horror function associated to that point, the level sets are circles tangent to that point. They're usually called horo, horo cycles or horo, horo circles. And so here's 0. These are the level sets. Inside here, chi is positive, And outside, chi is negative. So it's not like in the plane where there's some symmetry, there's some central symmetry here. It's negative most of the time. And if you, if you look at things around O, around the base point, and it's positive in a small horo ball. OK? So that's a, a big difference. OK, so let's take the theorem. Maybe. Or, should I, or should I erase? Uh, who knows what I should be doing here? <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah, OK, well, I'll state it over there. Who cares? Done with this. And, okay. All 
All right, so here's a theorem. And this is uh, joint work with Matias Carrasco. And Elliot. So the theorem says uh, the following. Okay, you, you have a distant stationary sequence. There are plenty of examples coming from products of random matrices. There are other examples. Uh, so let it be distant stationary. Uh, and you have to assume some boundedness of the jumps. This is, this is in all our regarded theorems, you have some the function is integrable or something. Otherwise, the averages can do anything. So this is the natural. The, the, the first jump, on average, is there's, there is some average. There's a finite average value for the first uh, jump. OK? Then uh, there exists a random horror function. Such that. Okay, I'll write it in full. So the left hand side is the integral of the speed. So if if, if you if you have some ergodic uh, situation, that's just the speed. It's a constant number, which you're trying to understand if it's positive or not. And uh, on the right hand side, so this is an asymptotic property of the sequence. And the right hand side. You have also an integral. There are two variables. And uh, one is this random Horo function, so you're integrating on some measure on the Horo boundary. And the other one is just the, the first step of your random walk, so it's not asymptotic at all. It uh, only depends on the first step, but there is some new probability measure on the Horo function boundary, which you don't know anything about in principle. And then there's a second part which would not pass a uh, Hardy's test for <laughs> beauty, so I'm going to just uh, say, <laughs> say just a few words, which is some information is given about uh, dependence or independence of uh, the Hora function and uh, the first step of the sequence, okay? Which, which is actually very important. It's a very important thing because you have the quantity which you want to know about, which is the speed. So assume it's ergodic, this is just a number. And you have it equal to some double integral where you know the projection of the measure onto the first coordinate is just the distribution of your first step x1 that's given. But the projection onto the other coordinate, you don't know it. And you, don't, you have to know something about the joint distribution of those two things. So the measure is not a product. So this, this parenthesized part tells you that in, in the classical cases, it is a product. In other cases, it gives you something to work with. Yeah, OK. So you can just, you can, you can just say there is some probability on the, so what this, what this statement says is there is some probability on the space of points times or a function. It projects to your. Uh, probability for the first step on the points. And on the other side, you don't know anything. But there is some measure, and a double integral of this thing, which depends on the horror function of the point, gives you the speed. So I'll give you an, an application now, and that will, that will end the talk. But so essentially, uh, you don't have to introduce random objects, but what probabilists do is they, instead of looking at measures, they look at functions from some probability space whose push forward gives you this, this measure. So it's, and it's very convenient because they can take extensions and things without actually bothering to, to do a new product of the space and things like this. But it's just an, a notation. It's not very deep. So I'll give you an example, and this will finish. Uh, OK, or several examples. <laughs> okay. So yeah, let's, let's look at the applications. OK, 
Okay, so positive speed uh, for right angle ran random walks. Hyperbolic plane, right? Uh, with explicit lower bounds. Uh, so the, the positive speed part is known. Okay, the, the idea is the following. That will give you the idea. The idea is that the, that formula over there, which, which you were asking, what, what does that mean? It means the following in this case. You have zero, and you have the four points, A, B, C, D, which are reachable in the first step uh, from zero. You're just going to be one of these. In the first step, you're going to be one of these four with probably one fourth each. And the formula will just give you the following. It will give you the speed. OK, this is r. And it will give you the speed equals integral uh, chi of a. Chi, OK, I should write this somewhere else. <laughs> formula gives you that the speed of the random walk is integral on the Hora function boundary, okay, which is just a boundary, it's okay, uh, of chi of A plus chi of B plus chi of C plus chi of D over 4, oh, over 4. And there is some measure new on the boundary, which is unknown. You don't know about this. You don't know anything about this measure. But the point is that the, the measure doesn't matter, because if you take any Hora function, the place where it's positive looks like this, the place where it's negative looks like this. And you can show that for any Hora function, the sum that is in there, sorry, there's a minus sign, the sum that is in there is negative. So this is positive, and it doesn't, the measure doesn't matter. Mu doesn't, nu doesn't matter. Okay, that's more or less the trick uh, Furstenberg uh, introduced to us uh, in the 60s, which is you express, it in, you express what you want to know in terms of some measure which is unknown, but then you show that it doesn't matter. <laughs> that's the, you, you, you may lose estimates, but you, you at least get something. Okay, so there's an example. And uh, yes, okay, this case, I, I actually use that the, so, so this double integral, I, I use Fubini here. I first integrated with respect to the, the measure here, which is one fourth, one fourth, and then I integrate with respect to the other. But in general, you don't get uh, this, this Fubini. So you, ha you have some dependence. It's not a product measure. So there you, 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 you get much less. You're not going to get, but in the independent case for IID matrices, it's, it's going to be independent, and you're going to get a nice first and weird formula. So maybe I should say that, okay, for, oh, this, this was known. Of course, of course this is known. Yes, because you look at the worst case possible for this thing, and it gives you an uh, apparently sharp uh, lower bound, because when R is very large, it gives you R over 2, which is the speed on the tree times R, which is, it looks reasonable. And when R is very small, it gives you something, R, R squared or whatever. It, it looks like it, uh, it gives you good bounds. So this was known by Furstenberg theory. And also, there's an explicit paper, expository paper, where, where somebody did the translation to products of matrices and et cetera. OK, so and the other one, I want to say, give you two more. Another application is a positive speed for on HD if, or let's say for lambda small. So lambda was the number of points per unit uh, volume. And this, this is also known. This is known 
uh, for d equals 2, all lambda. It's this year, and as a probability, Benjamini. Okay, then Pfeffer. And uh, all the is a preprint <laughs> last week. <laughs> okay, fuck it. But the method, so he extended the method they use here, but the method that they give is completely different. It's, it uses something completely different, and you don't get any estimates. So, also estimates. <laughs> and this is new. Okay. But yes, it, it was known. So this, uh, it was unknown until last week, let's put it this way. But, uh, and so, the other example I want to give, okay, maybe I shouldn't erase the theorem. <laughs> okay, I'll erase the, the positive speed for right angles, random walks. But the example I want to give so that the, I can justify the appearance of Furstenberg in the title, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, is that if, uh, if A1, A2, et cetera, are IID in SL2R, so it's you know, the Bernoulli measure on the, shifts, on the product space of two by two matrices, uh, it gives you that there exists new uh, probability on A probability. New, and let's call it on the circle. You can do projective space if you want, such that. And you get the of exponent. equals, uh, you, get, uh, you get the double integral, SL2R and S1, and you're going to just look at log of norm of the matrix times the vector. You integrate with respect to the vector, the measure nu on the vector, and the measure mu on the matrix. And mu is, is, is given. Mu is the, just the distribution of each. Uh, so it's a Bernoulli uh, measure, mu times mu times mu, and that's mu. So what's unknown is mu, but you can still, you can still obtain some conditions. This is a first number. You know, from the big paper on commuting random products from 63. So it, it is a, a first number formula, and you do obtain first number formula. You can obtain. Uh, the criteria for positive exponents from starting starting from here, if you follow the rest of the paper of first number. <laughs> and so n, n times n matrices, what you get immediately is a formula for the sum of squares of exponents. So it also gives you a criteria for the existence of a positive exponent. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much.